Okay, I am going to go through the basics of electrical engineering for non-electrical engineers. Basic, well, especially for chemical engineers who are in my 1705 class. Uh, you'll get some of this in physics. I hope uh, some of this is familiar to you from your physics courses. But anyway, if uh, I was giving this as a lecture, I'd be asking you now, what is electricity? What is voltage? What is current? Um, but I hope you should all have some sort of working knowledge of, you know, there's a, there are electrons, they are attracted to nuclei, but in metals they're able to flow relatively freely with a little resistance. If it's a superconductor, then there's no resistance. But anyway, uh, voltage is the potential of those electrons to flow, and current is basically the flow of electrons, their flow rate. So, you know, why do we care about this? You all got into chemical engineering, not electrical engineering, but the fact of the matter is is that you are not going to be able to avoid uh, issues of electrical engineering. Every, you know, every valve that's controlled is controlled by an electrical signal. It adjusts the, maybe, maybe the percent open of the valve, or every piece of analytical equipment that we have is going to measure some sort of voltage or current. So it's an integral part of any chemical engineer occupation. So, as such, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to find a way to understand what, what's going on, but um, to me it's most intuitive to use the hydraulic analogy. Just a moment. So, basically, the hydraulic analogy would have um, these two situations being analogous, where we've got a high flow rate of water here, and we've got a high flow rate of electrons here, and we've got high pressure on the bottom of a dam here, and high potential for electrons to flow from the charge in the cloud to a sink in the ground. Um, and I'll give you an example of, of what that should look like. Uh, so if we were to look at a uh, very simple system like this. We were to build this in real life where we had a tank of water um, open to the atmosphere. Uh, what would your intuition say if we were to measure the, the pressures you know, outside the tank right just below the line of water and at the very bottom of the tank? Again, if we were in class, I'd be asking you this, but um, <clears throat> you know, I would hope that you you would have some understanding that you know outside the tank it should be one atmosphere. So if we're measuring uh, absolute pressure, it would read one atmosphere. If we're measuring gauge pressure, where it's the difference from atmospheric pressure, it would read zero. Here, the, you know, we've just got this little bit of weight of water pressing down on it, so the gauge would be the needle would be a little bit off the gauge. And here, because we've got a lot of water sitting on top of it, then this gauge should have a lot more pressure. As for the flow rate, um, that's going to just be a function of the pressure, right? So the water has to make its way through this tube, through this, these flow meters, and as you might expect, if we were to do this in real life, it would look something like this. So we'd have greater flow rate at the bottom where we have great pressure, and we'd have a little bit less flow rate coming out in this top tube where you have less pressure. And you know, in the atmosphere, we have zero pressure, and these two gauges would be measured relative to the atmosphere. So this system right here could be directly analogous. You could think of it as the circuit, where we've replaced flow of water with flow of electrons, and where we've replaced pressure with uh, volts. So just like pressure, we always measure volts compared to something. Uh, it could be, you know, where we have gauge pressure or absolute pressure, where it's measured compared to the, the vacuum, or gauge pressure, where it's measured compared to one atmosphere. With the uh, voltmeter, we always compare it to ground, so, you know, if you uh, take a look around your house, you might have a, a uh, big metal spike that goes into the ground, and all your house electronic appliances are all grounded to that that uh, metal rod and every other volt is compared to that, every other voltage throughout your house. So 
we draw ground with a symbol like this. So again, just like with the tank of water, down here we have two power supplies. This one pumps the voltage up a little bit, then pumps it up even a little more. So this is like the height, that, that small height of the water. This is like the the big the the total depth of the tank. And uh, going through the tubes, we'll talk about the hydraulic analogy with resistors, but you know, to, to go through a pipe, there's some resistance. There's resistance of flow due to the friction of uh, the water interacting with the surface of the pipe. This is confusing. Uh, don't worry about it too much, but it's just a quirk of history that when we talk about flow of in electric circuits, circuits uh, positive current it means negative flow rate of electrons. It's just something we have to live with. Oh, dinner's ready. Be right back. Wait, I'll finish up this slide. Um, so, yeah, just like this previous example, whoa, greater flow rate occurs where we've got greater voltage. A little bit less flow rate occurs where we have lower voltage. Okay, so the hydraulic analogy, again, currents a lot like the flow rate of water or any other fluid. It's measured in amps. Voltage is a lot like pressure, so <clears throat> it's measured in volts compared to ground. But you can imagine, you know, if you've got a, a tank full of water and it's at high pressure and you make a little hole in it, it's going to spew out water very fast. If it has low pressure, it's going to just leak out just a little bit. So, okay, moving on, I think. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's first talk about power. What is power when we're talking about electrical systems? It's you know, probably have encountered concepts of power. It's basically joules per second, energy spent per second. So you have a light bulb that has certain wattage. That's how much power it's it's uh, consuming per amount of time. Um, <clears throat> so. <clears throat> In an hydraulic system, a source of power can be, you know, the pressure of a water. We can use that to turn a generator and create electricity. Um, it's a lot like uh, that height of the water is a lot like a battery, if it were to stay that same height. But of course, it, it drains, well, just like a battery. Um, <clears throat> so, what are some types of power supplies we can have? AC, alternating current, or DC, direct current. AC, you know, it's cyclical, like a sine wave. Uh, DC, you know, you just set it at like 5 volts, 10 volts, and it stays constant. Uh, there are many different types of power supplies. So, you know, it can be anything from your famous potato clock, where it just works on, a, you know, you have two different types of metals inside of this aqueous solution that's uh, separated by the cells of the potato. Uh, you're familiar with batteries, solar cells, uh, like I said, uh, generate power with uh, flowing water in a hydroelectric dam. Um, but it's ubiquitous. Of course, you've got, <clears throat> you know, we have these, now they're, they're, we're creating like uh, uh, nanomaterials that create electricity through uh, piezoelectric effects. So piezoelectric effects are when you, you when a, a metal is deformed or, or a material is deformed, it creates a voltage, and there, thereby you can uh, pump electrons with it. But your body is full of these sorts of generators. So, like, much more comfortable. So, like a uh, uh, an ion channel or an ion pump inside of your cell, it uh, moves ions from one side of a membrane to another, and that creates potential by which you can do things like fire your muscles or, or you know, get nerve signals from one place to another. So this is what, uh, you know, when we're drawing schematics, this is what power supplies might look like. So you might have a battery or a single cell. Uh, we call minus n the cathode, plus n the anode. Uh, if you have a DC supply, you might have a DC current supply. So this supplies a certain amount of amps, so, so you might have like one amp set to be sent through whatever your circuit is, or it might supply a constant voltage, in which case it would look like this. 
or you might have an alternating current voltage supply, so you know, it's cyclical, like a sine wave or a square wave or a saw wave. Uh, and also, you know, typically when we draw a power supply, there's some sort of ground in there as well. We usually assume that the ground is part of the, uh, you know, on the uh, the cathode side. If you were in front of your power supplies, you could familiarize yourself with them, but uh, you can do that when you're in lab. So let's talk about some of the components that are in electrical circuits. So I've drawn some designs here, or symbols, and they all mean something. The first one is a resistor. So here's a bunch of different kinds of resistor, a rheostat, a potentiometer, a thermistor. It's a resistor that changes resistance depending upon the temperature it's at. Or some, you know, These are the type of resistors that you'll see most often, these little carbon film resistors, which has a pretty much set resistance. Um, what do resistors do? They resist, of course. So <clears throat> you should know this equation, Ohm's law. So basically it says the voltage across you know, anything that resists, a resistor, is going to equal the current times some factor, the resistance. So the current is directly proportional to the voltage. So these are measured in ohms. So that symbol there, you might have mega ohms or kilo ohms. Um, so what would a resistor be in the hydraulic analogy? And what types of resistors are there? So like I said, whenever water is flowing through a pipe, it you know, it, it takes some energy to get it to flow through that pipe uh, you, because you know the water is interacting with the surface of the pipe, which which stops the water right at the surface of the pipe, which you know slows down the water just a little bit below that, a little bit until we get to the the bulk of the water where it's all flowing. But but you know there's some energy loss in that friction. So you could have a resistor would could be just like a pipe. But if you wanted a higher resistance, you could constrict that pipe so that you know the water is just squeezed through there. It's more difficult to pump the water through that that constriction. You could think of it like uh, you know if you had a, a tube and you're putting water through it, and you put an atmosphere of pressure, you could get a lot of water to go through, you know, like that one inch tube. But what if you packed it with sand or, or something like that? Then you'd have greater resistance. Um, when you go to put a resistor in your circuit. You're going to see a lot of them that look something just like this. This is a photograph. And they have these bands on them, you'll see. And these bands tell you what resistance the resistor is. You could use a multimeter to measure that, but you, know, you can just read it right off of here. So the first two bands are basically the first two numbers. So the first band here is red, so that's 2. So it's 20 something. The second band is blue, which is 6, so that's 26. Third band is orange, right? So that's 1,000, so it's 26 kilo ohms, and then this last band, which is either gold, silver, or doesn't have one, that's the tolerance. So it's plus or minus 10 percent, 5 percent, or 20 percent. In this case, it's silver, so it's plus or minus 10 percent. So it's 26 plus or minus 2.6 kilo ohms. In your homework, you will uh, determine the resistance of this resistor here. Okay, so in symbols, when you're drawing your schematics, resistor typically would look like this. In the UK, I believe they draw them like this. Um, potentiometer looks like this, so you can actually dial where this line is, or a rheostat, you can control the resistance there. Or a thermistor would look something like this. Okay, next is capacitor. So, <clears throat> capacitor is basically two plates, and uh, you've got a wire coming out of, of each of them, and they're separated by an insulator, something that doesn't conduct electricity. So, uh, this is a picture of a capacitors. They come in a couple different designs: ceramic or electrolytic. Uh, we'll talk about those more when you, if you ever have need of these. But uh, you're not going to need to know the transient behavior of a capacitor. You, you'll uh, you'll inter interact with that, and you, you'll deal with that later in your coursework. But um, you should qualitatively know how these would behave in a circuit. So. Uh, in a capacitor, what are you doing, bud? No, no. But do you need to talk to me? Okay. Um, 
capacitor basically stores energy in an electric field. And the equation that governs it is this one here. So the, uh, the current through a capacitor is proportional to the change in voltage across the capacitor with respect to time times some proportionality constant, which we call the capacitance. Um, and we'll talk about how this plays out in real time in just a little bit. But these are measured in farads, um, often in microfarads because you know a one farad capacitor would be quite unwieldy, huge. Um, the hydraulic analogy for capacitors is a little difficult to envision, but I don't know, not, maybe not really. It's like a, it's like a, uh, a chamber where in the middle of that chamber you've got, you know, like a rubber diaphragm that, so nothing can flow from this chamber to this chamber, but the pressure can, you know, you can press on that diaphragm and it can push this water out and pull, you know, this water can come in as that diaphragm flexes as, you know, more pressure is put on it. And so, that you, I mean, you can imagine as long as the diaphragm doesn't break, there's, there's, you know, there's going to be some flex at which it's going to resist any, any more movement. So, you can think of a capacitor like that. They're often drawn in schematics you know, like this, but you might have a polarized capacitor, so you cannot hook these up wrong. You have to have the uh, positive end attached to the positive voltage, otherwise they can explode. We don't like that to happen. So, inductors. I've never really used these that much, but I mean, they're kind of like the anti-capacitor, and so it's, 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 if you can understand capacitors, it's kind of good to go through these. These are basically a wire coil, often around an iron core. It's, instead of storing energy in an electric field, it stores it in a magnetic field. These are measured in Henry's. So, as you can see, the equation is, is just the flip side of what a capacitor is. Here the voltage is proportional to the change in current with respect to the change in time across the inductor and that proportionality constant is, we call that L. So the hydraulic analogy for an inductor is basically a water wheel. So imagine you've got, you know, you've got a stream and in that stream you've got a water wheel and it's stagnant but then all of a sudden you put pressure on one side of that water wheel. So you you maybe add more fluid or pump more fluid in. It's going to want to flow, but at time equals zero, that water wheel is set still, and so all that energy goes into getting the water wheel moving. Uh, but after a long time, that water wheel's you know spinning along, whirring along just fine, and it's as though it's not even there because it's just moving along at the same speed as the, as the water. If it was an ideal water wheel, in uh, Schematics, they're shown like this, or inductor with an air core or iron core. So I just wanted to drive this home. So say that we had an inductor or a capacitor, and at time equals zero, we suddenly apply a voltage across the inductor or the capacitor. What is the initial current? So like a water wheel, if we, we, we start applying a voltage across an inductor, it can't get moving until to, you know that water wheel starts spinning. All the energy goes into to setting up that magnetic field. So time equals zero. There's no current through the inductor. It may as well be a break in the circuit. But at time equals infinity, when that water wheel is is spinning along, then as, as though it's not there, the the current just goes through without any uh, hindrance. Whereas the capacitor is just the opposite. So it's like that rubber, you know, this the rubber diaphragm. So at time equals zero. And we we first put a little pressure on that diaphragm. It it flexes as though it wasn't there at, right at the beginning. But as time goes on, it stretches and stretches until it's at the point where it's pressing back on the water as much as the water is pressing on it, and it can't flow anymore. There can't be any more current. So at time equals infinity. <clears throat> it, it basically stops. Uh, did I say that wrong the other way? No, I didn't. So. For an inductor, that when time equals infinity, it's as though it's not there. It's just straight wire. Time equals infinity for a capacitor, it's as though it's a break in the circuit. Whereas at time equals zero, it's just flipped. Okay, next one. So a diode is basically an asymmetric resistor. You will talk about p-type and n-type, silicone and all that in uh, some other course, but. We're not going to worry about this. We're just going to worry about how we can use them. It's basically a, a one-way sign. So current flows one direction, not the other. Um, 
yeah, if you get uh, car sick watching this, just back away from the screen. Um, okay, so types of diodes. Here's a, here's a bunch of them, and uh, we're going to use them quite often. So here's just a typical diode that just lets current flow in one direction. They have some uses, particularly particularly when you're converting like an AC voltage to a DC voltage. Um, but you also have LEDs. I'm sure you. I mean, you're looking at probably a screen that's composed of LEDs right now. Tiny ones. You have uh, photodiodes that you know, with which you can measure light intensity. Uh, keep in mind that when you you have a diode like an LED like this, the, there's always a long wire and a short wire. The long wire is the plus end, the anode. Short wire is the minus end. If you hook it up the other way, again, electrons don't flow. It's a one-way sign. Either that they don't flow, or you can uh, burn out the diode. So the hydraulic analogy with this is pretty simple. If any of you've owned a fish tank, you've probably put in a, a check valve or something like that to keep it so the water never drains out of the fish tank and uh, causes havoc. But uh, check valves basically, you know, if there's flow along this arrow, then it pushes this plug out and it can flow around the plug. But if you try to flow this other direction, it pushes the plug into the hole and no water can flow to the left. It can only flow to the right. So in schematics, diodes you know look a lot like this. This would be the cathode. This would be the anode. If it's an LED, you show these little arrows of light coming out. If it's a photodiode, you show the arrows of light going in. So you know this would measure light intensity. This would create light. Okay. Now I just want to talk briefly about a couple of the laws that you will need to um, do your homework and to design some of your circuits. So determining currents and voltages. Now this is an oversimplification, but this little baby here is playing peekaboo because finds that entertaining because uh, it's just learned about object permanence, or maybe hasn't yet, and that's why it's entertaining. So you learn this about the age of two that uh, things do not just simply disappear. They, you know, matter does not disappear even though you can't see it. It goes someplace and it can come back. And so, like I said back there. Most of what you're going to need as a chemical engineer is just understanding that that things are conserved, mass is cons or matter is conserved, conservation of mass. Um, <clears throat> so it just doesn't appear or disappear. Energy is conserved as well. So if you have some energy going into a system, you've got to have that same amount coming out, or it's got to accumulate in that system. So no matter what we have going in in terms of matter and energy, it either accumulates inside the box whatever the box is, or it comes out. It doesn't vanish. Uh, void for nuclear reactions where energy can become matter. You're not going to need to worry about it. You best not. I hope there's no worry about that in this course. Um, so basically, these have been given the name Kirchhoff's Laws when it comes to uh, electrical engineering. You know, this is technically a conservation of charge, but can be thought of conservation of mass in our case, where you know if we've got an electron going into a wire on one end, then it's going to come out the other end. It's it's not going to disappear. So if we look at any node, or, or say we look at this resistor and draw a box around the resistor, if we put current I naught into that box, we know we're getting get, going to get current I one out, and they've got to be equal because you know there's not going to be just electrons piling up in this resistor. So if you look at any node in a circuit, so let's say like this one here, and say we've got you know current I1 coming into the node, current I3 and I2 coming out, going into the capacitor or the inductor, we know this has to be true because they're not going to disappear. So this is a summation. These are negative just because you know these are leaving the box. This is positive because it's entering the box. Next law is there's conservation of energy, basically voltage across different devices. So if you sum up all the voltages around any loop in a circuit, those have got to equal zero. So if we look at each component, so there's one, two, three, four, five components in this circuit, and you can make but basically you can make three loops. You can loop around this uh, this series, you can loop around the outside loop, or you can loop around this inner loop here. So we have the power supply, which creates a you know, an, an increase in voltage. 
We have the resistor where you know we lose energy as we go through the resistor. We have an inductor, which again, you know, because it's not ideal, we can lose energy as we go through that. It can be a function of time. Diode again, even though it you know it's a one-way resistor, it may have some resistance. So across all these things, you can have a change in voltage. So if we want to calculate, you know, maybe the voltage drop across any one of these components, we can use uh, Kirchhoff's sec second law. So in this case, the the red loop, we have a positive voltage gain, and then we have a drop through the uh, resistor, a drop through the inductor, and a drop through the uh, did I put capacitor there? Oh, so this should be four V four drop through the diode. This one's right. So through the blue loop, you know we have a gain, so that's why it's positive in the power supply, and then we have a drop through the resistor, a drop through the uh, diode down here, and a drop through the capacitor. And this green loop basically says that the voltage change over this component has to equal the voltage change over this component. So these equations will be useful in uh, doing your homework. It's also, you're going to probably be doing a lot of these in your physics course. Uh, and I've done some example problems that you can use in uh, the next screencast. So that should shed a lot more light on this. But anyway, I will leave it at that. And uh, we'll see you in class shortly.